National Nancy's the fourth in the Alex Reynolds mysteries author Fred Hunter St. Martin's Press New York 2000 narrator Eric Ost chapter 5 I wasn't quite sure what mood mother would be in when we got home I hadn't exactly handled things very well when I confronted her about Simon I suppose I could have been more circumspect about it, but I excused myself somewhat with a reminder that it's natural to be on edge when you think your mother is dating a bomber. As usual, she surprised me. If she'd been Dame Edith Evans when we left, she was Gertrude Lawrence when we returned. Darling, she said grandly as she glided up to me and gave me a peck on the forehead. I was your detecting. Was it productive? If her manner wasn't suspect enough, her missing H told me something was up. Our detecting was fine, I said wearily. We managed to get a bit of information, I explained what we'd learned from Mary. That sounds very promising, doesn't it? She said when I'd finished. I leveled my gaze at her. What's up with you? Whatever you do, you mean. This is me, mother. I know you. You were angry when we left. And now you're acting like something out of a Noel Coward. What are you up to? Nothing at all, she said with a shrudge. She was only lacking a cocktail in one hand and a foot-long cigarette holder in the other. What gave you the idea I was angry? Peter was unsuccessfully covering a wide grin with the fingers of his left hand, and he seemed to be vibrating. The way you acted when I asked you about Simon, I said. Oh, that she replied with a flip of her hand. I was a trifle put out about that at first, but I decided that you were perfectly right in what you said. Simon is virtually a stranger, and he was in the office at the time in question, so it's only right that we investigate him. It is. My weariness had pretty much gone through the ceiling. And since we're agreed on that, and since he says he would like to get to know you better... She emphasized the word says, mildly mocking my suspicions. I've decided we should all go out to dinner. What? I exclaimed in disbelief. If I hadn't particularly wanted my mother dating this guy, I wanted even less to accompany her on one of her dates. I talked to Simon this afternoon, and he thinks it's a marvelous ideal. He's taking us all out to dinner this evening. Peter couldn't hold it in any longer. He laughed and said, You're right! That's wonderful! You're joking, I said to Mother. She spread her palms. It's perfect. You'll get to know him. He'll get to know you. And as long as he's a suspect, I'll get paid for going out with him. You see, darling, everyone's happy. Despite any personal feelings I had in the matter, I couldn't deny that Mother's idea was a good one. Whatever her own motives might have been, dinner together would allow us to conversationally probe her new boyfriend, hopefully without appearing to be anything more than naturally interested parties, which is why at seven o'clock that evening, Peter and I found ourselves dolled up in suits and ties, out on a double date with my mother. We were seated at a table in the corner of the room at Mon Petit. The restaurant Simon had chosen because it was the first place he dined with Mother. He explained that because of this, it held a special place in his heart. It was all I could do not to grimace when he said it. Peter and I sat at a discreet old married couple distance from each other on one side of the table, while Simon sat close beside Mother on the other side with one arm casually draped across the back of her chair. I had to admit that Simon was, if nothing else, suave in the extreme. His navy suit was immaculate, and he sported a black tie that fanned out from a small knot at his throat, down his crisp white shirt. The gray hairs on either side of his head were slicked back along with the rest of his dark mane. He oozed British charm. He paid close attention to mother's wants and needs and listened intently to every word she spoke. He was so perfect a companion to her, he could have done it for a living. So... I said, taking a sip of the champagne that Simon had ordered before we'd even reached the table. How are your seminars going? He screwed up his handsome face. Deadly dull. I'd much rather spend the time with your mum. Mother beamed and wrinkled her nose at him like a rabbit in heat. 
If I'd had a grapefruit, I would have squashed it in her face. Simon opened a menu which he shared with her. It was nice of your company to foot the bill for a trip like this, I said. Which company was that again? I worked for a large computer company, he said in a slightly tired tone, designed to let me know he didn't relish talking about work during his off hours. Yes, but which one? I'm very interested in computers. Are you? Yes, Peter and I keep meaning to get one, don't we, honey? Uh-huh, Peter said dully. I got the feeling he didn't want to participate. Oh, yes, I keep meaning to get one. I continued, ignoring the fact that there was currently a computer sitting on the desk in my home office. What would you use it for? Simon asked. Oh, a million things. Mother might have told you that I have my own graphic art business. I could use a computer to keep the books. You're a freelance artist, he said, apparently impressed. That must be fascinating. Mother sat smiling across the table at me. It wasn't until I saw her expression that I realized Simon had managed to turn the tables and we were now talking about my work instead of his. Not really, I replied. Your work is probably much more interesting. You know, I was thinking that since I want to get a computer one of these days, maybe you could get me a deal on one. Actually, he said smoothly, we don't really sell computers. We don't sell directly to the public at all, as a matter of fact. Oh, really? What do you do? There was a bit of a sigh, just enough to reinforce the idea that he didn't like talking about work when he was away from it. We develop new microchips. Far too difficult, really, to describe to the layman, and most of it is rather hush-hush. You know? He lowered his voice and said in an amused, conspiratorial tone, Industry, spies, secrets, and all that. I could never really discuss what we're doing. How convenient, I thought. Really, I said with interest. I'm sorry. Which company was that again? He hesitated for a split second before answering. It's called Cyberdyne. I'm sure you've never heard of it. Actually, the name did sound familiar to me, but I couldn't call to mind where I heard it before. I tried to comfort myself with the fact that I'd finally gotten the name out of him. All quite silly, really, he continued. All this hush-hush business, but I do have to abide by the company rules. Peter looked at me with a half-smile and raised eyebrow, as if to say, Are you satisfied? I wasn't really, but couldn't see a way to press on without appearing unduly inquisitive. I was saved from the embarrassing pause by the arrival of our waiter. Of course, since Mother was the only female at the table, he addressed her first. She looked to Simon in a way so annoyingly feminine, I almost asked the waiter for a grapefruit. Simon asked him for a recommendation, then ordered the suggested entree for the both of them. Then Peter and I gave our orders. As we handed the menus back, Peter leaned over to me and whispered, You might want to wipe that look of horror off your face. Once the waiter had scurried away, Simon said, Gee, tell me, you've had a bit of excitement in your lives. Which bit? He laughed. I hope your lives don't get much more exciting than having your office explode. Oh, that, I said. Well, we weren't there at the time. It's funny, though. It happened the day after you were there. Really, he said with surprise, his accent deepening. Fancy that. Good job you weren't there when it happened. It happened at five in the morning, said Peter. At a time when nobody was supposed to be there. But somebody was. That's dreadful, Simon exclaimed. Who would do a thing like that? That's what we'd all like to know, I said pointedly. There have been a lot of threats leveled at Charles Clark, so it seems as if one of them has been carried out. He looked across the table at me with such innocent interest that I couldn't help but try to shake his composure. But all it is now is a matter of sorting through the threats and following them up. Check up on all the people who were in the office. I'm sure the authorities will be able to track down whoever did it. Well, that's comforting at least. I don't fancy the idea that there's some maniac bomber running around. Oh, it's not necessarily a maniac, I said slightly. It could be someone who was hired to do it for political reasons. Mother laughed. Alex, you have such an imagination. Simon shook his head and smiled. I'm afraid American politics is just beyond me. I never can straighten out all those different levels of government and positions and things. If someone wanted to hire me to bomb someone, I wouldn't even know what it was for. What would that matter, I asked. I then cried out drawing the attention of everyone in the restaurant as a sharp pain shot through my ankle. Oh, I'm sorry, sweetheart, Peter said with barely believable sincerity. 
I thought that was the table leg. What were you trying to do? I snarled under my breath. Kick the table over? Excuse me for a moment, said Mother, trying to keep from laughing as she rose from her seat. I'm just going to powder my nose. Simon rose with her like a perfect gentleman, and his eyes followed her as she crossed the room. He resumed his seat, and there was only a few seconds of silence before he leaned in toward me. I know what you're after. I beg your pardon, I said with a glance at Peter, who couldn't have looked more surprised than I did. I haven't failed to notice the tone of your questions. I, I, I'm sorry if I... No, 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 he said expansively as he sat back. Nothing more natural. I've been squiring your mother around the town like an aging suitor. Of course, you would be concerned about my intentions. Your intentions, I said after a beat. I didn't realize you had any. I can assure you they're completely honorable. I'm glad to hear it, he sighed wistfully. I've never had this happen to me before, you see. What? I've never met a woman quite as smashing as Jean. I'm afraid she she's hit me like a ton of bricks. She has that effect on most men, I intoned. Oh, not like this, he continued with a shake of his head. I never expected when I came over here that I would meet someone like her. I tell you, it's fair to knock me for a loop, and I dare say she feels the same way about me. You do, I replied, hoping I didn't look as perfectly aghast as I felt as at what I was hearing. Oh, I realize it's only been a few days, and we're only at the beginnings of having a relationship develop, but how long should it take anyway? And that's the reason I've decided to stay on a bit once the seminars are over. I know it may seem like I'm rushing into things, but I was really only expected to be over here for a fortnight to begin with, and I'm not going to be able to stay over much longer. I shall have to go back to work, you see. I sputtered something ineffectual. I know everything seems to be happening very quickly, he continued, but I've only so much time. I can understand your reticence, but I do hope you wouldn't think of standing in the way of your mother's happiness, would you? Hey, I, I, Lord Alex, I almost jumped out of my skin. I'd been so astonished I hadn't noticed mother's approach. You look like you just swallowed a tack. Are you all right? I looked up at her for one shocked second and shook my head briskly to clear it and snatched up my glass. I'm fine. Don't worry. I, I haven't swallowed anything. I downed my drink in one gulp. The rest of the dinner was subdued, at least on my part. Mother nattered away while Simon made very dignified cow eyes at her. Or whatever the male equivalent is. Bull eyes, I suppose. Peter bravely kept up our end of the conversation, although I could tell he was as nonplussed by Simon's professions as I was. I spent the evening trying my best not to gap at Simon. Occasionally, I caught Mother looking at me as if a prescription drug disclaimer was written on my face and she was having trouble reading it. After dinner, Simon drove us home in his rental car. There was an awkward pause when he parked in front of our house. He and Mother made no move to get out of the car. At first, I thought Simon's manners had finally failed him, and he didn't realize that Mother was waiting for him to come around and open the door for her. But I was proved wrong when she slewed sideways, looking at me over her shoulder, and said, I'll be in in a tick. Oh, I said stupidly. Peter and I popped open our respective doors and climbed out of the car. On the way up the steps to the house, Peter said, Well, that was embarrassing. I'm not the one nuzzling in a car, I replied. He stopped beneath the porch light and looked me in the eye. We've nuzzled in our share of cars. We're half their age. Right. And when we're their age, I, for one, intend to go on nuzzling. Was it your plan to stop sometime? I sighed. You know, I really hate it when you're so damned reasonable. We sat in the living room, switched on the television, and watched the news while waiting for Mother to finish whatever she was doing. The news, of course, was full of the bombing. A reporter stood in front of the rubble, offering some of the speculations that had been put forward over the course of the day. The terrorists had been responsible, or zealots, or the ever-popular militia theory. There were clips of press conferences. Clark decried the use of violence and the senseless loss of life. He sounded both saddened and disgusted by the event. Fritz Peterson seized the opportunity to denounce radicals. He seemed to genuinely disparage anyone who would resort to violence. 
while at the same time managing to make it sound as if his opponent had brought it on himself. With his ultra-liberal views, the candidate's appearances were followed by a clip of the Reverend Nat Albertson, head of the right-wing church, located on the northwest side, who expressed his disappointment that anyone would kill to get their way. And then he explained that he could fully understand the frustration and fury that people feel toward potential legislators like Charles Clark, who condone perversion and would try to make it socially acceptable. And that when people are confronted with evil, sometimes they might feel that violence was the only recourse. And then again, he added, non too quickly, we don't condone murder. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, I said. This jerk doesn't condone murder unless it's against someone he doesn't agree with. It was almost a half an hour before Mother joined us. She sat down near me on the couch and let out a contented sigh that I'm sure was meant to irritate me. I switched off the television. That was nice, she said. Dinner, I mean. Simon is really a charmer, isn't he? Why is it I always think of charmer and snake together, I said. I don't know, dear. She wasn't exactly smirking, but she certainly looked as if she was finding something very amusing. Mother, we need to have a talk. Cool. This sounds serious. It is. However, how do you feel about Simon? I should think that's obvious. I like him. You do. I couldn't help feeling just a little heartsick, but hoped I didn't sound it. Of course I do. He's very handsome, he's great fun, and he's a marvelous companion. Are you serious about him? Her smile disappeared and she knit her brows. What kind of talk is this? I think he's serious about you. Alex, you sound just like a teenage girl. What's gotten into you? Simon, that's what. While you were away from the table, he said some things that that made me believe he's, well, serious about you, and I don't know how else to say it. I looked over at Peter and turned my palms up in a plea for help. Actually, Jean... As much as I hate to agree with Alex in this, since I don't think he has any business nosing into it, Simon really did sound as if he was smitten with you. Her face opened like a happy flower. Smitten? Is he really? I like that. And I just wanted to make sure, I said soberly, that you weren't going to allow yourself to get rushed into anything. She beamed at me with one eye narrowed for a very long time, then she leaned over and kissed my cheek. Don't you worry yourself, darling. She got up and smoothed her skirt. I never get rushed into anything. I didn't want to be a part of, and I assure you, I know how to handle Simon. She went up the stairs without another word. I turned to Peter and said, Why is it I worry more when she says things like that? Peter sighed and came over to the couch. He sat close beside me and took my hand. Well... Are you at least satisfied now that Simon is only after your mother and is not the one who planted the bomb in Clark's office? He whispered this in my ear as he rubbed his nose against it. I thought about this for a moment, then said, Not so fast. What? He replied, pulling back in disbelief. Think about it for a minute. If Simon really was the bomber, if he'd wanted to infiltrate the office, what better way would there be than to get involved with mother as it so it wouldn't seem odd? if he went there with her. Come on, Alex. Then the best way for him to avoid suspicion afterward is to express this sort of over-the-top affection for her. Ignoring the fact that your mother is inherently lovable, that's what makes it all so perfect. What better cover? Anyone would believe he'd fallen in love with her. Peter's face was a picture of incredulity, and then he uncurled his lips and broke into a wide smile. Come here. What? He put one hand behind my neck and drew me toward him. Come here. What are you doing? I said, totally baffled. I'm kissing you, you idiot. He planted his lips on mine and gave me a long, deep kiss. When our lips parted, he said, I don't know why, but the goofier you get, the more I love you. I hesitated for a moment. The stirring below my belt told me where he was going but I wasn't sure I was ready to drop the subject yet. I said, Yeah, but I'm really... The end of my sentence was lost as Peter touched his lips to mine. Again, his tongue gently darting into my mouth. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I was dimly aware of having been worried about something. 
but it would be hours before I could remember what it was. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.